Sup Frosties? Today we have another guide. We're going to be doing another one of the Frost Haven starters. This time the Bone Shaper. The Bone Shaper is a low health, high hand size, kind of like support uh, controller damage mix. Does a lot of things, but usually in very small numbers. So it doesn't have access to the biggest crowd control, the best heals, but it has lots of summons and other effects that really add up to a volume amount of small effects that have a huge impact on the scenario. Her biggest focus on the class is, of course, summoning and allies. Uh, starting at level two, there is a big escort build that we're going to be doing, but by default, we're going to be leaning into the uh, standard summoner build. If you want to go heavier on curses or do a status effect build, that's also an option, but primarily we'll be talking about summoning builds in this guide. Be sure to subscribe to be kept up to date with all of the Frosthaven content that we'll be releasing, and subscribe to Patreon if you want early access and other sneak peeks. It's one of the more versatile starters, if only because she can serve potentially multiple roles, knowing that uh, she can do a lot. She doesn't necessarily, she's not usually going to be the top of damage dealt, she's not going to be the top of healing, although she absolutely could because most of my groups don't have a lot of healing going on, uh, but the skeletons she summons can take hits, which can result in your party taking less damage. She can heal herself, she actually has the ability to do direct damage, has a lot of status effects, and just does so much. She also has a lot of things that say allies, but don't necessarily say summoned ally or not. So she can eventually have like some synergy with allies, especially some of the synergies she has with like the blink blade where she does grant movement, but the blink blade says all allies get bonus, bonus movement. So you can potentially double dip with cards like that. Alternatively, whenever she grants the drifter attacks, it does use his uh, uh, increased abilities, so you can potentially grant really large attacks if you do grant it on uh, a Drifter. That's not every card. A lot of the cards will specifically say Summoned Ally, so just be sure which ones say Ally and Summoned Ally, because there's a lot of potential there. As we go through the cards, I will point out these synergies. You'll be primarily using the Dark and Earth elements. Uh, you and a Deathwalker might be fighting over or potentially helping each other with the Dark element, but otherwise you should just be able to use the Earth element on your own until a locked class is unlocked. We won't be talking about which ones do that. Something that is important though, a lot of the cards are very powerful but cost you health. Given you have a low health pool and a lot of cards that hurt yourself, you will need to spend extra focus on having the ability to recover. So I will suggest in uh, both build options uh, to take some self-healing. Also, there are items that are incredibly important. And I will tell you about one item you can buy right off the bat, but over the course of the campaign, you're gonna be wanting to use a lot of these. So these more powerful effects you'll be able to get more out of. Also, as a result of this, because you have a lot of cards that say active in play and you use your health a lot, I encourage you as a general strategy, if you can long rest with the Bone Shaper, do it because that generally just helps you gain more of your resource back than compared to other classes. So for level one, we're only going to talk about one build, and as level two, the paths diverge. You can have the big boy build or the mini build, graveyard build, or whatever you want to call it, but a uh, skeleton horde, if you will. So the paths will diverge, but at level one, we're only going to talk about one build. So let's get into the cards. Damned Horde. I'm actually going to talk about three cards here. So we're going to talk about the top of three cards, and then we're going to go to three different bottoms. Uh, these three cards are relatively all the same, but they have some differences. But let's just get into the top. Summon Shambling Skeleton. You'll have three of these actions available about level one on three different cards. Uh, it gives you a summon that's got three health, two move, and two attack. It's very basic. Should look familiar to the uh, summon that you can get in Gloomhaven. Also, every time you summon a skeleton, you suffer two damage and gain an experience. The cool part about this is, is if you are able to chuck out lots and lots of skeletons, that's a good amount of experience, but you will be damaging yourself every time, so you'll need to find ways to recover from it. Um, since you do have six health and you have three skeletons, you're going to have to, if you do want to put all three skeletons into play, um, immediately... <laughs> Uh, you will have to unfortunately find a way to heal yourself between those. You do have some healing effects, so, and there is an item you can start with that gives you a heal, so it's not, not all is lost, but um, sometimes you actually just want to play too, because the bottom effects are very powerful. Ultimately though, this is going to be your like bread and butter summoning. The two move, two attack skeleton with three health is on not just this card, but on some other cards as well, and there are other interactions that actually interact with the shambling skeleton specifically, including a level five card that buffs all your shambling skeletons, but not your other summons. Welcome back, Lily. So let's get to the bottom. 
uh, if you don't use the top of Damned Horde, the bottom gives you the ability to curse up to two enemies, provided you're within range of up to two enemies. Uh, pretty good if you're positioned well. This does require you to be at least aggressively positioned, though, because it's got an initiative 77, and you're going to... So you're going to be going pretty late unless you cut with an early initiative card, and then you have to uh, be within range two of them. So it is really good if you have, like, a banner spear who can protect you, just take some of the front hits, or perhaps you can t time it well, or you've got a, like skeletons in front of you that you know you're going to take the hits. This could potentially shuffle a lot of those in the deck. And curses are actually extra important because, like, you know, you have some classes that have like you, six, and you have the eight and ten health classes, uh, where if someone takes three damage, they're like, okay, well, it wasn't great, but I can recover from this. Whereas your skeletons, once they take three damage, they're just out. So this makes it where curses actually are super useful for skeletons because if an enemy draws a curse, curse on your skeleton, that's basically giving them another life. They're, they're huge. Uh, so that's that's really important. So despite the fact I'm saying there's a bit of an asterisk on the bottom of this card, it's actually hugely valuable to you personally. So as a result, obviously, it's a, definitely a take. I love Damn Tor. Life and death. So one thing I do like about this card is the 91 initiative. The 91 initiative is so late, you'll be able to uh, not undercut, overcut uh, enemies to where you can make sure you can get the summon in, in a spot that they are going to appear and then not just instantly die. And then you'll be able to use an early initiative in the next card to undercut them. Uh, that's something I really like about this card. The 91 is my favorite. Uh, also it had, does have a pretty cool effect. The next three sources of damage to you prevent the damage and the third point of damage gives you an experience. This is actually pretty big because it's sources of damage. So if you are using this um, potentially later in the scenario, uh, when you are like, hey, I really need to get these summons back out, but I'm like, I'm dying and need to short rest or something. You can potentially put this into play uh, to allow you to generate your other skeletons without suffering damage. You can potentially walk through traps. This is something we've done before where it's like, uh, there's a big damage trap and our other summons are going to do it. We just run across it with this active, so on and so forth. Another big point I want to point out is there's actually a really big damage card later that makes you summon multiple skeletons, but you take six damage. This actually stops the whole six damage. So this synergizes as well with that. But So this one, that's it's okay at low levels, but gets better later. Return Servant. Same top as the other ones. But here's the thing, the bottom's a move four. The 81 initiative is also still really good, but move four is just universally good. If you can only get two summons out during the rest cycle, you still get the bottom to move four, and you actually are pretty lacking in mobility. So being able to use this for the large burst movement when you need it is significant. So like I said, you don't need to summon all three skeletons and have all three out at the same time. The bottoms all have their specific purposes. This one is kind of my favorite, if only because uh, a skeleton is used on so many cards and what you're going to be using, and the bottom move four is just universal. I would have liked a higher initiative because 81's not as good as 91 in this case, but hey, uh, you can't have everything. Angry Spirits. I really like this card because uh, the weird part is I thought, I know when we initially uh, t t had the first version of this, the, the spirit, had an attack too, and I was like, God, this is so good. And every time I left feedback, I'm like, oh, it's so good. Uh, it turns out it's too good. Uh, and here's the weird part. Even an attack one is really strong because over the course of the scenario, just pinging out one one is huge. I know it's only got shield two, but if you do bring the Warden's Robe, you can potentially save the summon with a shield four for one uh, rest cycle. And usually it rarely gets out of place. And that's the big thing. The Unlike other um, summons, like the skeletons will get themselves into very bad positions and just get themselves killed. The Wraith actually will survive for the whole scenario pretty reliably, giving you two experience and it'll set up darkness for your next turn. It's actually very strong. Uh, with a range of three, two movement flying, uh, this one's a very strong summon. Um, I don't always use it in every scenario, like especially if there's scenarios where there's a lot of um, enemies that have shields or um, ranged Italiate, I just didn't use it at all. But especially at low levels, when you're fighting a lot of the Algox, this ended up being incredibly powerful. Not only that, but the bottom is super strong. Uh, on the next death of one of your summons due to an attack, the attacker suffers two damage. It's kind of like Retaliate, but then you need your skeleton to die. And not only that, but it actually doesn't have a range. So if something shot it, like an archer shot the skeleton from afar, uh, they'll still suffer the two damage. So non-loss, direct damage, 
it's a really good bottom action. Um, this is also really good because you have to suffer two damage to summon it. So this allows you to put the bottom action in to say, all right, you know what? I'm going to pay that forward. So that two damage goes to another enemy. I just really end up liking this card, both sides. Now, they ha each have their own situations of usefulness. So uh, I don't necessarily lean one way or the other, but the top action uh, is something I don't like to use to summon uh, in scenarios of shield. Like I said, the bottom action is really good for scenarios of shield because you can just break through that damage directly with your smaller summons. This isn't necessarily that great because the skeletons still have to pierce through shield, but you do actually have the ability to give skeletons pierce on a couple cards. So we'll talk about those. And here we are, Command the Wretched. So this is a great one. Grant one of your summons, any of your summons at any range, move plus zero, attack plus zero, which is fantastic. And if you have dark, it also gives pierce two. Now, a lot of times you're not going to be fighting pierce three very early. So at the early levels, this usually allows you to just do direct damage with one of your summons if you have dark. Uh, just to the enemy without having to worry about their shield. Now, worst case scenario, if like, well, they don't have shield. Cool, you don't need dark. Just move plus zero, attack plus zero, and you control the actions. It's pretty great. It's hard to really complain about this. Also, the initiative is late. So if your uh, summon is out of position, you can still use this to move them into position late. Bottom is pretty fantastic, though. Grant any one ally, attack five. So this is fantastic because you can at least say hey skeleton whap on that guy over there you have ways to give your skeletons or allies strength in so that you can set that up and do that and create a really big powerful attack this one's especially powerful though like i said earlier if you have a drifter uh with crushing weight this actually grants them an attack seven whoo which could just destroy stuff uh that's one of my favorite combos in the whole thing so that says grant anyone ally so if you have any of your melee allies in position guess what boom you can use it on them and they'll be a very appreciative. Dark Tidings. Uh, so this one's a really interesting card that's really good for um, the Skeleton Horde build, but not as good for the single summon build. Regardless, it's a strong card because it's a very good conditional top with a bottom that's just universal. Let's move four, hey. Move four is really good. The initiative does suck though. I really hate middling initiatives and the Bone Shaper really needs more early initiatives. But grant three of your summons, attack plus zero, and then every uh, time they, an enemy survives that, you curse them. This reminds you kind of of like fire orbs where you know you can attack, do three attacks, but this one's only, you have to have three of your summons in the right place. But you can if you surround one enemy, attack them all at the same time, which is huge. And also there's curses between them. On the other hand though, if you have dark, you also poison them. This is actually really powerful if you can surround one enemy and do dark tidings. I know it's a loss, but it's a very high impact loss in the right situation. Uh, so high impact loss in the right situation with a universal bottom, that's a good card. Decaying well. All right, one of the worst parts about the Bone Shaper is retaliate. The bottom, we're just gonna talk about that. If someone's are immune to retaliate for the rest of the scenario, holy crap. It's um, really hard to complain about this because there's a lot of times like, hey, my flame demons and you know frost demons are killing my guys. Cool. Uh, now frost demons really aren't even that men menacing with this up. Just watch them fall apart and just make a bunch of attacks on them. The top is still really strong. First off, attack one at range five, poison and infuse earth is still pretty decent. It's a huge range, first of all. And um, being able to get an element that you need and then poison the enemy, which is poison's really good with your guys is nice, but then you get a plus one attack to it if you do have a summon next to it, which is just really, really solid. So uh, I like this card, except for again, middling initiatives. It's gonna be a problem with the Bone Shaper all the time. Eternal Torment, uh, this is another card I really like. First off, if your summon is anywhere near coins, use the bottom action to scoop everything under the, the feet of that summon. This is really important because looting is very important in Frosthaven. It's so important to rebuild Frosthaven. I don't want to go into like why looting is important, but just let it be known. The bottom is super useful. The top, on the other hand, also insane. Curse one enemy at range five and then infuse dark. That already is okay. It's not amazing, but it's good. Then if a summons adjacent to the thing you cursed, they get a free attack on it, which is huge. This one is one I will, at starting at level two, when you're doing the single summon escort, becomes much more powerful, but you get much more harder hitting undead, and that makes this one just naturally more valuable. Fell Remedy. All right, uh, heal an ally. It's only an ally, and that sucks, because I really want to use this on myself, but uh, heal one ally within range three for two, and potentially four or six, depending on what elements you have. If you have you know, both elements of play, congrats. Heal six at range three. Fantastic. Um, <sighs> not sure I'm like a huge fan of that because if it's if it just said anyone, oh, this would be incredible. But now it's just 
good because healing your friends is always good. Again, this is another one where if you're escorting one minion across the map instead of three, that becomes more powerful, so that's strong. The bottom hand, on the other hand, heal oneself, which is solid, and then if an enemy has already died this round, perform another heal oneself, which is really cool because if you have like, uh, like poison on you, uh, this does, the first heal one will remove all negative status effects and potentially heal you one as long as you don't have poison, the next heal one will always land. If you are using this for the summon builds, where you are suffering a lot of damage, this gives you the ability to recover from that. Flow the Black River! If you're using the Skeleton Horde, this is one way to like, uh, the, th the top's really good for the summon horde, and the bottom's really good for both the skeleton horde and the uh, single summon build. Heal X plus 1 equals to where X is the number of your summons. If you're using the horde, this could potentially be a very high number and could reset you all the way. Especially if you're using the wraith and three skeletons, this is a heal 5 self, could potentially allowing you to reset your health. And the bottom is move two, and then grant one of your summons move two, but it's also an initiative 18, which almost undercuts the nastiest cards, but it also gives you the ability to go uh, earlier than most monster behavior cards, which is something you don't have. Also, because it gives you some positioning, you might be, uh, you might be able to have allies uh, go in to attacks and potentially bail them out instead. That's really important. Keep in mind, it says grant one of your summons move two. You control that movement and they don't actually need to be within a certain range of you. So you don't even need to get close like a lot of the Banner Spear things that say like grant an ally within range X move blah. So it's important. Malicious Conversion. So uh, this is actually a really neat card if you can set it up correctly. The bottom, move three, but conditionally move five. I'd much rather have a move four, and you do have a couple of those conditional cards, but uh, that's not bad. But it is one of those 26 initiative, which is solid. Uh, move three or five, which is solid. And then uh, th this just fits very well for the Bone Shaper. But the top is a melee attack four. Melee is not something you want to do, but it does give you uh, an experience earth and dark, which is something you absolutely want. But if you do kill the target, which is a little conditional, you can immediately play a card out of your discard, and then if you perform with a summon action, and then if that summon action makes you safe take damage, reduce the damage taken by two. That's huge because if you do happen to uh, keep on having to churn out uh, skeletons, uh, this could potentially reduce the damage you take. It gives you a contingent bonus action. So being able to do a top action and then also get a top action while getting the two elements you want, it's a bit of an if, but there's some situations where you're pretty sure you can say, hey, let me finish them off. I'm pretty sure I'm going to go fairly early and then I'll be able to get a skeleton out of it. That's really strong. Transfer of Essence is a very powerful card. Uh, you you already have another a lot of like earth and dark generation, so this one becomes very powerful in three or four player, or if you're escorting a single summon. Uh, the single summon build is very powerful off of this. Poison adds a significant amount of damage for your volume of attacks between all your skeletons and yourself, and also groups with large numbers of people will just be able to get that due to volume. Remember to strengthen allies over strengthening skeletons, because allies are almost certainly going to make more use of it than one of your skeletons. Uh, the bottom is also really strong for the other build. Now, the problem is since you suffer two damage and then heal five, a lot of times you're not going to be saving your own skeletons. That's not just going to happen at all. Um, you could potentially heal some of your allies too, so potentially if you take two damage to heal a friend, that's fine. But the skeleton build's usually going to be suffering a lot of damage that you can't suffer even more damage, so it becomes hard to play that in that build. But for the big boy build, if you're only summoning one and occasionally summoning others to uh, just add a little bit of effect for fun, uh, no, and it's serious, it's actually pretty good to summon other skeletons. You're not just going to be summoning a single uh, guy throughout the whole thing. But um, the, that one becomes more powerful because if you do get that summon pretty low, you can, a heal five is huge, and your own health isn't as important in that build, or in any build, than to keep that summon alive. So that's huge. It's, it's an incredible action on a bottom non-loss that also gives you dark, which you can use on several cards. Wrath of the Turned Earth, love it. Uh, grant one of your summons attack plus one, which is nice. But then with Earth, you also poison them, which is fantastic. Uh, uh, attack plus one, this is going to be generally useful more on the, uh, if you have a high hitting uh, summon instead. So uh, the, the once you hit level two, the, um, the mega summon build will be using that a little bit more. Although now it's just primarily like for skeletons, it's usually just do an attack three that might also sometimes be an attack three with poison. But uh, the bottom is actually really strong. On the next three sources of damage to your one of your summons, prevent the damage. This can potentially be like three disarms. It's huge. Now, of course, if the enemies are doing multi-attacks, this does suck, but um, 
on the off chance that it's not that, and you can figure out in the scenario, figure out what monsters you're fighting, whether that's going to be useful or not. The bottom of this can be huge, because if you can just prevent the first three attacks done by having a, a summon up there, your allies will thank you a lot, and you're, you, then they still need to kill their summons after the first three sources of damage that hit them. It's huge. Exploding Corpse is the card I wanted to. I, I wanted to like this a lot because it reminded me of Diablo 2, where I had my Necromancer build, and you know this used to be called the Necromancer. Uh, so I'm like, yes, yeah, I finally get it. And uh, not gonna lie, it's a bit of a disappointment. It's fine. Um, so attack for everything next to the skeleton, whatever summon you do, and then kill it. And then you use fire. You don't really use fire. I mean, if you got a gem in it in your group, sure. But <sighs> attack for and everything next to it. The loss is, it just doesn't feel as strong as I want it to be. It's harder to set up. <sighs> I can't help but always just feel whelmed by the effect. And then the final thing is, uh, the next time an enemy dies this round, everything next to it suffers two damage in the hex that it died. So you have to like set it up real good that you know you're gonna kill something at range that it's not gonna take damage. The 21 initiative is really good for the Bone Shaper, but the abilities are just doing it no favors. I just end up not taking this in a lot of them. I don't know. Uh, it's, it's just not my favorite. <laughs> Alright, Approach Oblivion. So, uh, this one's harder to use, but I do like it. Uh, I do like this at least better than Exploding Corpse. Um, heal for all allies within range 2, which is great, but you have to have, like, a certain amount of allies, uh, within range that actually need it. And then also Bless. Uh, now, of course, you're like, hey, you can heal, you can bless your own allies and create a bunch of blesses there. Yeah, but, like... The, the, the problem is the next two parts of it. So yeah, you can heal your allies, but you have a lot of allies, so heal force is probably not doing anything and you're just trying to like bless yourself. But then you also damage yourself and curse yourself, and it's a loss. So that and this is one of the losses that doesn't produce an element for you, so I don't know what to make of it. I'm not ultimately not a big fan of it. It uh, in the right situation though, where you do have hurt allies, um, like in four-player mode and possibly have a bigger summon that's hurt. Uh, during those situations, the two damage and curse self and a loss is actually way more valuable. So, um, not gonna lie, it's um, potentially really strong, but I've just found those situations to just be quite uncommon. The bottom gives you the ability to move your summons move three, which is great, but then it gives you wind, which is not something I'm a huge fan of for, like, I mean, maybe if you have a banner spear and they need it, I don't know. <sighs> yeah, I... I, I this, this card and Exploding Corpse are pretty situational. I'm not really a big fan of either. <laughs> uh, but this, this card's got some situational use and the Initiative 53 still sucks. Now we're gonna get into the level up cards. Unearth Horror. Remember I was talking about the um, how there's a uh, single summon build? This is the first of them. Uh, don't get me wrong, there's other summon, single summon builds, but the Unearth Horror uh, is your first of them. Health 6 gives you the ability that it probably will not die in one hit. And if you are taking 6 and 7 damage a hit, it's, uh, you're probably not playing at scenario level one, but move two, attack three every turn, and then all your things see a lot of the a lot of balances on like grant a summon is based off move two, attack two. So move two, attack three becomes notably more strong. But um, even then, the bottom is still pretty strong uh, for the other build because you can just pick one of your summons, poison everything next to it, and fuse earth. Now that but the 94 on a summon means that you're often going to be able to create the raging corpse. Uh, and at, a, at a, such a late initiative that when you go the next round, um, you can potentially initiative weave to the point where he's probably going to at least survive the first round unless you've timed this utterly horribly. So um, the Raging Corpse is your first of those out of the other build, so that build's obviously going to pick that. Bone Dagger, on the other hand, is a loss. It's kind of a little counterintuitive. Counter attack four plus one for every one of your summons. So if you have like four summons in play, attack eight, but then curse they survive. Attack eight's usually enough to kill some things, but some of these Algox are pretty beefy. But it gives you dark, it's a loss. It's a attack four curse that could potentially go higher. Almost always, that's gonna be at least an attack five curse. So uh, it's not bad, don't get me wrong. The bottom of Bone Dagger is really where it shines. Uh, curse an enemy within range two, or if you have dark range four, then um, if that enemy dies this round, you can create Create, you can summon something out of your discard pile and reduce the damage taken by two. So if you do, you know, like, oh no, my skeleton died, um, you can always just say, hey, curse that enemy. Everyone dogpile them and they're just like, hey, I get my skeleton back where they died. It's so good. Uh, that one, that one's really great. Not only do you get a free top action if they die, you do get a card out of your discard, and you get uh, to prevent the two, for you from taking the two damage. So that's huge. 
I personally think that this is where the build split. If you do really like summoning lots of skeletons, the bottom of Bone Dagger is just incredibly strong. But if you do like to summon a single one, the Raging Corpse is the start of your ability to actually start to pump out a little bit more damage. Level three. Uh, so grave digging is uh, summon shambling skeleton, but it only makes you take one damage instead of two, which is nice. Uh, but then also the bottom allows you to uh, you take one damage, but then you perform a, a summon action on anything in your discard. This can be nice if you want to play the bottom action of one of them, or if one of your summoned skeletons die, and then you just want to get them back. It only costs you one damage, but potentially more. So this can add up to a lot. Uh, ultimately, though, the grave digging, the grave digging's late, late, late initiative is still really good in the top, allowing you to summon something for less damage is still strong. Pierced Cloud, on the other hand, is uh, very, like, kind of like Exploding Corpse. The part that makes this better, though, is it gives you Earth instead of Fire, and it poisons them instead of done, doing no status effect, and it's not a loss. So I do vastly prefer uh, the top of Pierced Cloud. Although the single single summon build is going to. Uh, uh, yeah, big, big Boy doesn't want to blow up their own summons, except her. you will sometimes summon uh, skeletons. You could use it there, but ultimately, uh, the, both the level 3 for this build is not really strong for that. The bottom, on the other hand, is whenever an enemy uh, attacks you or one of your summons, they gain poison. They're already poisoned, they suffer a damage. You, you don't actually want to take a lot of attacks, so the bottom of Putrid Cloud's pretty strong if... Um, you're doing a lot of skeletons, letting them die, and then uh, piling on the people that they've just died. That, that works out pretty well, but uh, grave digging to the single summon builds a little bit better because although you will occasionally summon skeletons, uh, taking one damage instead of two is just better. Uh, the other build uh, depends on how you're leaning. Uh, if you want a fourth skeleton, grave digging's got to be the way to go. And uh, if you want to get some of your skeletons back because they die, grave digging wins. On the other hand, future cloud is incredibly useful if you want to blow up your skeletons and or just dump a lot of things on the enemy. Especially if you're playing in four player and have a lot of allies that are able to attack them after. This will give you a lot of free poison. So putrid cloud becomes a little bit more accessible. Plus the initiative on it is pretty strong as well. Level four. So we have Flesh Shield and Critical Failure. Uh, flesh Shield. Whew. So uh, grant one ally, shield one or shield two, or retaliate one or retaliate two, depending on what elements you have. But you can potentially grant an ally shield two and retaliate two for the rest of the round, which is huge. Uh, the bottom, first off, initiative 16 is fantastic, especially because the Bone Sheeper needs it. The bottom half is take two damage, and then the next source of damage to your summons prevent it. So both of these are really strong. Flesh Shield's really good if you actually have a tanky character that you want to buff. And the bottom half is really good to save, especially if you're a single summon guy. Flesh Shield will buy that summon more time and you'll allow you to escort it through the scenario much more readily. Not only that, but it's infinite. So you can use that to set it up and then uh, leave it in play until they actually suffer the hit. And man, it's, it's just really strong. Flesh Shield's a very good card uh, and I like it so much. Critical Failure, on the other hand, grant one of your uh, summons attack plus one. Uh, which isn't necessarily great for a level four card, except for the next part. If you uh, consume dark, grant two of your summons that instead. So, this card is basically a slightly worse level one card until you have dark, in which case it's notably better. But you need to have two summons in play with a late initiative. Not necessarily my biggest, my favorite thing, so eh. Um, it's still good though. It's not bad. It's just good. Bottom, on the other hand, if an enemy draws a curse, and then that curse drawn causes them to deal no damage, every one of your summons next to it performs an attack against that enemy. Whew! It does say adjacent, so you can't have like the ranged summon be within range and get an attack on him, which kind of sucks, but hey. The Skeleton Horde build will probably end up leaning towards critical failure, but I, I could see Flesh Shield working on both. So Flesh Shield is the good default one. It's easier to use. It gives you a good initiative. But if you really like Critical Failure, it has some uses. Uh, the bottom is probably better if you have a frontline guy where your initiative isn't going to matter as much. Level five. So single summon guy gets so much better. Unforgivable meths, methods. Stitched atrocity. So this is kind of like the Raging Corpse, except in, you don't get Earth, you suffer two damage, which is brutal. But it has two more health, and then every time it attacks, it wounds the target. Whoo! That's huge. Not only that, but the bottom is a heal three, which you can use to heal yourself, or potentially heal four at range three. 98 initiative, big ass summon. It's really good. I I don't really need to elaborate that if you're going to sing, single summon build, um, 
It's really good because you already have the ability to do a lot of other things. Now adding wound to your arsenal just really is huge. And it turns all your granting attacks into wound. Solid bones on the other hand, all your skeletons have plus one health, huge. Plus one move, huge. And pierce one, situationally incredibly strong. But the bottom gives you move four and fuse earth. I think everyone knows where the picks are going. If you're going single summon, unforgivable methods is a very easy pick. On solid bones is really good for the skeleton build. Um, I'm sure there's more builds here, but ultimately it's pretty obvious. Uh, you, and also, not every scenario is solid bones. The top's going to be good, but the bottom's going to be universal for basically any bone shaper. So um, it's a pretty easy divide here. Rotting Multitude and Twisted Decree at level 6. Rotting Multitude, remember how I said earlier the next three sources of damage you take? Rotting Multitude gives the Skeleton Horde the ability to, um, with that, the ability to uh, take six damage, create two skeletons, and not take the six damage. So that's a lot of damage to do to self, but it does create two skeletons with one non-loss top action, which is huge. The bottom, on the other hand, grant one of your summons move four is huge, but then if you have dark, you also move four. That can actually be pretty strong as is. I know it's a level six card, but that's all just a lot of movement. The top of Twisted Decree, move plus one, attack plus one, is just really strong because, especially if you do have a big summon out, and not only that, but since you control the actions, you can move it where you want, and it gives you dark to set up a really good next turn. Not only that, but the bottom of Twisted Degree gives you a mere attack one, which sucks, but uh, uh, it's, uh, if they survive, which they probably will, it will poison and curse them, which is huge. Skeleton Swarm will take uh, Rotting mul Multitude, very obviously, and the single, uh, the single summon will take Twisted Decree, but Rotting Multitude would probably be good too, but I will just lean towards Twisted Decree. Recycled Limbs. So, um, the top is hilarious, because uh, you have to consume Earth and Dark, and then you play a card from your discard to summon. That's so it's for free, you get... You have to have the two elements set up, so it's a little bit of an F there, but you've got a little bit better element generation now that you're level 7. You get a free summon, but then you grant all of your summons a plus zero move and an attack plus one, which can be huge. Again, if you're the skeleton swarm, you can potentially also get one of those skeletons if they die back right there. And the bottom is the next uh, three deaths of anything, including your guys or enemies, uh, perform a two, heal two, targeting anything at range three. Notice that this can actually be really good if you're escorting a single summon or if you're just trying to heal your own allies. It's still pretty strong. Soul Claim, on the other hand, the next three monster deaths within three, add one curse card uh, to the monster modifier deck. Uh, does infuse dark when you put it into play, it's non-loss. But it is basically three curses that have an asterisk next to it that also infuses dark. It's not bad, because three curses reliably is pretty strong, but... Um, <sighs> It's a level seven card, and I kind of feel like Recycled Limbs just kind of beats it, and even Rotting Multitude from the previous level. The bottom, on the other hand, when the next monster dies this round, immediately play a card from your discard pile to perform a summon action, reduce the damage by two, and is if you occupy the next hex. That's, that's really good. So, but unfortunately you have to, it's still got if, 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 then, and it's still good. Because both of them are contingent on monsters dying, which isn't that big a deal, I, I don't, I I just haven't fell in love with Soul Flame like I have other things. I think the, so for the Skeleton Horde, we're going to go with Recycled Limbs, and I'm going to do something a little weird where the Single Summon build's going to go get back to get Rotting Multitude, because the bottom of that is really good to move four and then move your big summon four. It's just too good of a bottom. Level eight, so this one's a bit interesting. Endless Numbers. <sighs> summon Bone Horde. Health, seven, move three, attack three, attack plus one for every token on this card. Uh, shambling skeletons, skeletons may end their move abilities on this summon. Cool. If they do, kill them and add a token to this card. Every time, <laughs> whenever the summon suffers damage, you may remove a token to prevent the damage, and it also increases the damage of that. Remember when I was talking about the single escort? With the ability to summon a lot of skeletons on top of this, this is the ultimate one. You have to spend some turns to charge it up, some the ability. You have to move some skeletons on top of it, make it explode. But you can potentially get a move three attack eight on this once you finally set it up. And it's just too good. Um, I'm not saying that the other ones are now uh, bad because you actually still have to spend things to summon those and they have to die and so on and so forth. So you have to build it up but this can potentially build up to the biggest skeleton ball you've possibly seen. If that's not something you want to try, that's okay. I'm going to 
pitch an alternative, but ultimately this is the big summon. The bottom, on the other hand, it still says grant one of your summons move plus zero. And then if you, if you consume dark in the process, wound everything next to that summon after it finishes its movement. That's a lot of wound and it's a free move for one of your summons. You can position it where you want. Well, from beyond, it's one that I initially was a little underwhelmed with, but I'm, I'm, I'm clearly wrong here. Um, so attack two at three targets within range four. That's three attack twos at level eight is not necessarily great, but then everything that you hit uh, that's ad adjacent to at least one of your summons shuffle a curse into the monster deck. And if you have dark, you muddle them. Um, so this, this because of the amount of disadvantage this delivers, because of the amount of curses this delivers while still dealing a moderate amount of damage, this is a huge top half. And uh, I apologize to any time I cursed this in the past. Anyway, it's a good card. I'm sorry I said anything bad about it ever. The bottom hand on the path on the other hand, move three, heal three on an ally. If this is something you want to do to keep one thing alive, it's really good. But also you can reward a thing, which is really good on your big summons. So if you're like, hey, I just want to keep my unforgivable methods alive, just take Wailing from Beyond for the bottom. It's just going to be really good. Alternatively, you can take Endless Numbers for the bottom. Both of them will be good. If you're going the Skeleton Horde build, Wailing from Beyond is just going to win for you. If you are going the single summon build and actually want to dish out the most damage you possibly can, you take endless numbers um, and summon the Bone Horde, and then you use it, stack a bunch of skeletons onto it, and get that moving. It's a different play style, but that's why we're offering an alternative here. So these are kind of like three build paths, but by now you're level eight. Um, because this can p p effectively uh, negate attacks because you're like, oh crap, I don't want to do that. You just remove a token. You can potentially prevent it from even uh, taking damage and watch it just maul through enemies. It's huge. All right, and now we're at level nine. All right, I'm going to talk about Behold the Shrouded Sun first because I actually am not the biggest fan of it. So uh, Behold the Shrouded Sun is pretty okay if you want to use it for one of your uh, summon builds. If you're the, doing the summon, uh, this is the horde build. Uh, it banes the next time someone kills one of your enemies. That's not bad, by the way. It gives you dark, it's got a good initiative. It's pretty solid. That's a good pick. Uh, the bottom half makes you take two damage, but then every enemy within range five just straight up suffers the damage, which is a lot of damage. And it's two damage if you have earth and dark in play. Yeah, that's pretty strong. Unholy Prowess, on the other hand, I think any build should take. Uh, the Skeleton Sorcerer has an attack 3 at range 3, which is really strong, but it's 6 health and move 3. All Shambling Skeletons have plus 1 health, which if you're going for the Horde is huge. And then whenever one of your summons kills an enemy with a ranged attack, you can infuse Earth or Dark. Um, now keep in mind, you don't have a lot of ranged attack summons, but this could potentially add the hell up. Uh, especially because the Sorcerer has its own move 3, attack 3 at range 3, could potentially give you free elements on your turn. Uh, not only that, but it makes your skeletons just more strong. The bottom, on the other hand, is ignore all damage self abilities on your ability cards. Whew. So, if you're going the single summon build, uh, I'm going to be honest, the skeleton sorcerer is just really strong anyway. So, uh, just take that, and you can also do the bone ball if you really want. Alternatively, you can just use the skeleton sorcerer and make it do the thing. If you are creating the biggest bone ball in the world, um, the bottom of that allows you to just allow you to constantly summon skeletons and uh, <laughs> you're going to ignore the uh, amount of damage you take to constantly pile more skeletons onto that ball, make it move forward, grant it attacks, and it's really strong. If you are going the Skeleton Horde build, you can actually just use the bottom as well. So, uh, I, although I think if you're going Skeleton Horde, you probably want the top to, because with solid bones, it means all your skeletons have attack five, move three, attack two, pierce one. <sighs> That's brutal. So here's the level one cards you're going to pick for regardless of your build. And here are the level up guilt builds we're going to pick for the single summon. Uh, as you can see, we're going to be focusing more on single grants, single uh, granting single things or healing targets. And for the summoning horde, you're clearly going to be working into uh, more cards that target multiple enemies, do grant multiple actions, and a little bit less on healing because you're probably not going to keep skeletons alive. They're not going to survive multiple hits more often than not. So adding two plus ones is actually good. Ignore scenario effects because the scenario effects in Frosthaven are annoying. So ignore them and take two plus ones is great. Um, I'm always going to say remove the minus ones if possible, especially you can replace them with curses. 
uh, that's really powerful, but also moving on to the poisons. And also uh, to the next thing, uh, saving an ally is always really important. So if you can bail an ally out, do it. It's really strong. That's a really good perk to take. Um, the single summon one's never going to replace the zero with the plus one, kill the attacking summoning to add plus four instead. You're never going to do that. Yeah. The next one might be a little interesting. Each time before your rests, kill one of your summons to bless self. You do do that. Uh, you will actually, in the single summon build, be summoning a lot of the uh, skeletons anyway. You're not just doing one single summon, you're focusing on a single summon, but you will use some skeletons. That means every time you rest, blow it up, get the card back, recover it, and then you get a bless. And since your single summon is going to be hitting and punching harder, the blesses uh, have more mileage in your build. At that point, you can start to add some of the bigger ones, the plus two mixed element perks after that point. The, the skeleton horde build goes with the same idea, but you also, once you start to add the plus positives, where instead of jumping in the plus two, you the plus zero with the pl that conditional plus four, uh, and then also add the plus two mixed element after that. The, the, the ignore scenario effects and add two plus ones is basically the first mandatory perk you're going to take, and it kind of branches off from there. Um, but removing the negatives is probably the, the biggest thing, especially since you're going to be doing volumes of large, small numbers, you're going to be wanting to have as fewer negatives in your deck as possible. So I hope this guide helped. If you're going to be playing a Bone Shaper and are excited about it, let us know in the comments below. Uh, if you chose an alternative build, because there's a couple other options I didn't go over here, let us know what cards you picked. And if you do have a favorite card, gush about it here in the comments. I love to hear it. Thanks to all of our Inox tier patrons. You guys are amazing. I'll give you early access to various guides and other videos, and I'm uh, thoroughly glad that you support the channel. You're all thoroughly amazing. So thank you very much, and thank all of you for watching. You take endless hummer, <laughs> endless hummers. Oh, that sounds fun. Uh, I wish I could. I'm not going to talk about hummers right now.